dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome in, uh, in Pisa for the celebration of uh, Lagrange, 200 years later. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to, for me to introduce uh, Professor Giaquinta. We will speak uh, about uh, the early period of the calculus of variation. Thank you. Just to, just to be ready. Well, f first of all, as director of the center, I would like to thank you, the scientific committee, and uh, the speakers and all of you that are here. Uh, and uh, well, I hope you will. I hope you you will enjoy the conference and uh, stay in Pisa. So that's the title. I suppose that I have not to tell much about calculus of variations, at least looking at the people who are here. But nevertheless, I will say a few words. So calculus of variation is a field of mathematics, uh, complex fields of ma field of mathematics, uh, be complex in the sense that it's made by many different uh, um, subjects. So it's, uh, it's a collection of problems, is uh, a kind of a sort of uh, study of uh, specific structures like uh, that are called variational structures and then it's a collection of methods and uh, theorems and facts about uh, the problems and the structures. It has uh, a date, a birth date, as uh, I guess most of you no, and that's June 16, 1696. Ah, sorry, I'm not very used with the. Uh, <coughs> uh, when uh, uh, when Johann Bernoulli challenged the people in the uh, to solve the following problem. Given two points A and B, uh, was looking, look for the curve that uh, a body under its gravity will uh, travel in the least time. Okay? And that's it, everybody knows it's the path is the problem, uh, the least descent problem, and so on. Well, uh, I guess most of you are, are thinking now that it's not the first minimum problem in the history and it's not even a new problem. So let me just mention a few facts concerning this because it uh, will be useful later on. So there is a person, a man, whose name is Xenodorus. Nobody knows anything of him, except that he wrote a treatise on uh, isoperimetric figures. And there he proved that among n-gons of the same perimeter, the regular n-gon is uh, the one which includes most area. And that of the regular polygons with the same uh, number of sides, the one which in includes larger area is one with most uh, size, uh, sides. From here, well, it's very easy. I mean, it's very simple using a Dawson principle to prove the, the isoperimetric property of the circle or the isoperimetric inequality in the plane. For any reasonable figure, the area of f is always uh, of uh, the figure is always less or equal than one over four pi the perimeter of f squared. Next uh, or oh, next person I want to mention, next mathematician I want to mention is Heron. Uh, he, this is a very challenging problem when he lived. 
people agreed that he will live to surely between uh, 100 before Christ and 100 after. So in a period of 200 years. Okay, nothing more is known. But I mean, this is not special of these two people. I mean, it's typical of all Greek mathematicians. Uh, one knows more or less nothing except for the what uh, is reported on that. So that's uh, the reflection principle. He claimed, he stated that light propagates along the shortest way from one point to another, and from this principle he deduced that uh, uh, the light reflects in such a way that the incident uh, and the reflecting angles are equals. That's very easy, easy to see from the figure, actually. Okay. And then uh, comes Galilei. Galilei, well, he did very many things. Among that, he state the law of fall, that is, so that the velocity is uh, proportional to the square root of the height from which body falls down. And from this formula, you, one can derive immediately the time that is needed to time needed to travel an inclined plane. Doesn't work. Okay. Well, there is the inclined plane. And the time is uh, proportional to the length of the plane, of the plane, divide and inversely proportional to the square root of the height. From this, he proved, uh, he, he, he deduced the so called law of chords, that is, the time to go from O to P is the same as uh, the time going from O to B, from a falling body. And uh, the falling time along A, D, A, sorry, H, C is larger than the falling time from A to D and from D to C. Then he argued that uh, if uh, inductively you had points in between, then the time going from A to D, D to E, A to F, and F to C is less than the time from A to E and then from E to C. And then he suggests that uh, the, the curve of this descent should be or might be the circle, an arc of circle. Of course it's wrong, it was wrong, but he never stated it's that. He just uh, says that uh, this suggests maybe that. Okay? So, as you see, uh, the same problem was already considered by Galileo, Galilei. And uh, I suppose that uh, Johann Bernoulli knew it, though he said uh, that he didn't know about that when Leibniz uh, uh, observed, remarked that already Galilei already had uh, talk and uh, discuss the problem. Well, next uh, is Fermat. Now, everybody knows that, uh, uh, well, near maximum point or minimum point, uh, the, the variation of the function has to be uh, adequate to zero, which means it's essentially zero or is uh, uh, essentially zero compared to the variation or in terms of uh, Leibniz calculus that the differential of f at x0 zero is 0. And then uh, he state a sort of variant of Aaron principle saying that light always propagates in the quickest way from one point to another. And from this he inferred or proved Snell, Schnell law that is uh, the uh, uh, sign of the angle the, the, that the ray, the light ray forms with the perpendicular to the plane divided by the sign of uh, the reflected radio 
is constant and is proportional to the velocity in the first medium and inversely proportional to the velocity in the second, in the medium below. Okay? But I uh, just uh, talked about this because it's uh, useful, uh, will be useful later on. But you see, none of this problem is, uh, uh, I would say, can be considered similar or equal or whatever or analogous to the brachistochrone problem. Well, the point is that in all the previous problems we are looking for points. Okay? And we have just a finite degree of freedom in the problem. For the brachistochrone problem we are looking for a curve. So we have infinitely many degrees of freedom. Second, the calculus for the brachistochrone problem, uh, for, for all problems I have uh, mentioned, is uh, somehow easy because uh, uh, the claim that stays behind the all is that the variation has to be zero. And that uh, means that uh, uh, if there is a minimum point, then uh, the first variation has to vanish. Well, for the curve, we don't have any variation. We don't know what is a variation, and we don't know what vanishing of the first variation might mean. So for a while, uh, actually, people thought that uh, a sort of uh, uh, more advanced calculus was needed. So we all know that there is no need of any extra calculus. The standard calculus is sufficient. And that actually, I could finish everything in four, four lines, and write everything. But uh, my, the point of this lecture is to show what happened from, 19, uh, from 1696 until the first variation was written down in a sense which is very close to the actual one, to what we do. And that took exactly 75 years. And that because for 75 years nobody thought of the problems, but, because, but just the opposite. For 75 years people were working on the subject, and only after 75 years the equation was shown precisely. Now, why all that? Let me start with the idea of curve. I have used already function well, incorrectly, but uh, uh, for people at the end of 16th and beginning of the 17th century, what was a curve? As uh, you might imagine, a curve was a curve. There was no definition of curve. Curve is something that everybody sees and does. Mind. And the curve includes in its idea whatever is referred to a curve. So a curve includes, uh, say, the position points, but also the tangent, also the normal, uh, and also the curvature. All those elements are part of the curve and define the curve. Okay? which is a completely different way of thinking with respect to us. Okay? So any relation, or more than one relation, but concerning those elements would define a specific curve. Okay? Now, how to find a curve? So one of the most important points that was stated by Jon, Jakob, Leibniz, Euler, and many other uh, of the time, was uh, a very simple observation that if a curve minimizes a certain integral, then essentially every sub-arc of the curve has to minimize essentially the same integral, which is quite natural. Okay? And usually it's true Sometimes it's not true, but I mean, in this context, it's always true. Okay? That, what that means? 
means that uh, everything that the necessary condition for a minimizer has to be a sort of local condition and has to involve all that is local at a point. What can be local at the point of a curve? The position, well the tangent, maybe the curvature, and so on. So should be a relation involving all differentials. Nowadays one would say jets, but they are not very popular jets at our time, I guess. They were very popular in the 60s or 70s. Well, the equation should involve jets, okay? Which is quite an ach achievement, I mean, don't you think? So, essentially, a differential equation. And that's, uh, I wrote down here, Johann Bernoulli, as you know, I mean, Johann Bernoulli, uh, Leibniz immediately the day after Johann had state the problem, solved the problem. But then also uh, many other mathematicians, among them Newton, for instance, or Johann Ber uh, Jacob Bernoulli, the, the brother of, Fra of uh, Johann, solved the problem. And this is the solution of uh, Johann Bernoulli. You might read it, which is probably better than I, if I, I read for you. But anyhow, we, we shall consider a medium, oh, that's Bernoulli talking, not me. We shall consider a medium that is not homogeneously dense, but consists of purely parallel, parallel horizontally superimposed layer, of which each consists of a dia diaphanous matter of a certain density decreasing or increasing according to certain law. It is then manifest that a ray which we consider as a particle will not propagate in a straight line, but in a curved path. We know that the signs of the angles of refraction at the separate points are to each other inversely as the densities of the media or directly as the velocity of the particle, so that the brachistochrone curve has the property that the signs of its angles of inclination with respect to the vertical are everywhere proportional to the velocities. But now we see immediately that the brachistochrone is the curve that a light ray would follow on its way through a medium whose density is inversely proportional to the velocity that a heavy body acquires during its fall. Indeed, whether the increase of the velocity depends on the constitution of a more or less resisting medium, or whether we forget about the medium and suppose that the acceleration is generated by another cause, according to the same law as that of gravity, in both cases the curve is traversed in the shortest time. Who prohibits us from replacing one by the other? Well, then he writes, compared to the figure, that dx over ds is uh, proportional to the velocity, where the velocity is according to Galilei square root 2gy, and ds is of course the, the square root of the, dx square plus dy square. That's uh, the condition, which simplified become this one, and this is uh, the curve Huygens had already discussed, uh, and is uh, the cycloid. That's Johann Bernoulli solution. Jacob Bernoulli, so you see there are many, many things one can say. First of all, you, you see that essentially it's already stated that, uh, well, well, that's too much, but anyhow, we, I can express that way, that mechanics and optics are the same, same thing, okay? Now, Jacob Bernoulli did something slightly different. He considered an a, a infinitesimal piece of curve, and then he changed the medium point, the vertical medium point, varied the, me, the, the vertical medium point, okay, and then uh, essentially claims that uh, C, uh, the time for going to go from C to L, plus the time from L to D adequates to the time from C to B. There's, this is too much. T, C, G, D, along the curve, okay? 
Now this is uh, not bad. Then uh, using the, the, the Galilei law of fall, he arrives at the same result. But you see now uh, here there is a, 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 this idea that if we vary, vary a point, we are able to get to the uh, uh, to point to the necessary condition. And then he, 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 he stated, he, he asked the, the brother to solve problem where he imposed constraints, like his parametrical constraints, or even uh, uh, holonomic or non-holonomic constraints. Okay? So there is an extra equation that should be verified. So the minimizer, the competing function curves, have to ver verify an extra condition. And then uh, he had this nice idea that, OK, here we varied, we changed one point. But if we change two points, then we have two conditions. And that will allow us to solve the problem. That's what he did, actually. OK? Uh, in the same time, but already before the Brachistochrome problem, Johann Bernoulli discussed was looking for a curve of minimal length on a surface, which is even quite a complicated problem, actually. Okay? And essentially, so not completely, he had proved uh, that uh, for such a curve, if it's of minimal length, should be a geodesic, and uh, should be that is should be a curve for which the uh, the, the the curvature is uh, orthogonal to the surface. But he was not happy with the claim, with, with this idea, and he wanted to have an equation. Well, that was studied by Euler and uh, Clairaut, more or less in the, at the same time, and uh, more or less both. Both of them that were 20 years old, and they wrote the equation of geodesics. Okay? And now comes Euler. We are in 1944. And that's the time of the uh, Metodus Immediendi Lineas Curvas, Maximi, Minimi, Ve Proprietas, Gaudentes, Sive Solution Problematis, Isoperimetrici, Latissimo Sensu, Accepti. This is a, a treatise of uh, six chapters and two appendices, one on uh, elastic, on curves, elastic curves, and one on the la last action principle. So here he introduced general method, which are independent on the specific problem he was considering. As we have seen up to now, the brachistochrone has a special character, was a special problem, and the geodesics too was a special problem and was solved using the, what was special of the problem. Now, Euler wanted to have general methods to solve the problem. And that was he did. Then he treated more than 100 problems, minimum problems, and with constraints, with, uh, well, many kind of different problems, so all one-dimensional problems. Okay, up to now there is no two-dimensional problems, or two or more dimensional problem, problems, and they introduced many techniques. Actually, I mean, you can one can find there things like uh, invariant properties, uh, inner variations, uh, conservation laws, Lagrange multiplies. They are all discussed, discussing these hundred problems. These more than hundred problems. But he was never satisfied with the method. He thought that the method was to rely too much on geometry, and there should be a sort of an analytic method to treat the problem. That was idea, his idea. Now, well, to explain that, I have to, to tell you what Euler actually did, because otherwise one does not understand the thing. So with Euler, things change quite substantially. So let me quote a few 
sentences from uh, Istituzionis Calculi Differentialis, that is from 70, 1755, but actually is from 1727. He never published the, 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 the notes from 1727. So quantities that uh, undergo a change when others change are called functions. And that's the first time that uh, a, a sort of uh, a definition of a function appears. So different, the second claim, a statement I want to... I'm very curious why this does not work. So the second claim is differential calculus, calculus is concerned not so much with vanishing increments, which indeed are nothing, but with the ratio of mutual proportion. In order that this ratio might be more easily gathered together and represented in calculations, the vanishing increments themselves, although they are really nothing, are still represented by certain symbols. Along with these symbols, there is no reason and not to give them a certain name. They are called differentials, and since they are without quantity, they are also said to be infinitely small. Okay? Now it starts with a subdivision, starting from a point, x x plus omega, x plus 2 omega, x plus 3 omega, and so on. And then uh, he defines, he looks at the first vari uh, at the variation, so to the operator variation, fx plus omega minus fx. And is, uh, he, he, he notice that you can write as a function of x times omega plus another function times omega squared plus and so on. And then the second variation, that starts with the Q of X omega square plus other terms. I order terms in terms of omega. And uh, the same for the third variation and so on. Okay? And now comes the point when you take the quotient of the, differ the, the variation by omega, you find P of X plus terms which involve a factor omega. Okay? Now, now he, he invokes a sort of uh, transition principle, which says, well, that is valid for every omega, then it's valid for infinitesimal increments. That is, uh, if you replace variation by d, delta by d, and omega by dx, here you would find dx instead of omega, right? But the x is nothing, it's zero. So you end up with df over dx equal p of x. Now, I guess most of you would say that I'm cheating. Uh, if somebody is cheating, is Euler, but it's a wrong way of uh, looking at the problem, at the question. I mean, it's very convincing in a sense. It's very convincing for the time, at least. And that's the way Euler used. Yeah. And it was very far from him. Of course, you can write instead of df over dx, p, a, p w equal p of x, df equal p of x times dx. Okay? And it's by sure far away from, uh, say, finite element approximation or from a limit. There is no notion of limit, no notion of approximation in all that, but simply if something is true for a for finite variation is true for infinitesimal variation. And what is true is that only I mean infinitesimal variations are just zero. But for the quotient you get a, a finite quantity. Okay? Fine. Now I come to the to the general method of uh, uh, Euler. So as would be is natural, you call dx just the, the, the distance, the, the element, then uh, y xi you call i, y i, sub i, and pi are just the, the, the inclination. Zeta is a function depending on x, y, and p. p is the derivative of y. 
and uh, its, its variation is written as d zeta equal a coefficient m dx plus m dy plus p dp. Okay? That's the variation. Then he writes the integral as the sum of the value of that function on each uh, of the point xi, and it's the sum times dx. It's an infinite sum, sum because he, he has no extreme points. And now he looks, he makes a variation at point x1, which by now is x prime and x is the basis point. Okay, x0 is x, x1 is x prime. And then he looks at the, what happens when he varies at the point x prime. So you see what happens is that uh, 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 the, the, the only terms which are involved in the integral are just the terms uh, uh, zeta x y p dx plus z prime x y p. Only these two terms are involved in the variation. Okay, the first term, the zeta x y p, changes only in the first term changes only p, not the point, just the inclination, and so the variation is p. Sorry, you see, is p, sorry, d p p prime d x. But dp prime dx is just dy prime. So the variation is p dy prime. The term zeta prime, there change both y and p change. And the variation is n prime dy prime dx minus because uh, the, 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 the inclination is opposite, p prime dp prime dx. And again, the p prime becomes dy prime dx. So you put all together and you get p plus n prime dx minus p prime equals zero. Because the all is multiplied by dy prime. Okay? That is n prime minus p prime minus p over dx equals zero. And therefore, n minus dp over dx equals zero, which is just what we call Euler-Lagrange equation. Okay? Fine. That was uh, uh, all, I mean, all, that was before Lagrange. Now, Lagrange enters the play in 17, 1755 when he was 19 years old. Uh, well, just for information, uh, life, uh, Lagrange, li Lagrange life divides exactly in three, in three parts. From 36 to 66, for 30 years he was in Torino. Then from 1966 to nine, uh, 1787 in uh, Berlin, and then in Paris is uh, what happens uh, to, to many Italians, I guess, nowadays, that at a certain point they emigrate. But, uh, I mean, it used to be the same in the past, okay? And for the same reason, he got a position, Lagrange, very early, yeah? but he never increased his salary until 1766. You always get the uh, well, same salary. <laughs> so at a certain point, he decided to immigrate. Okay, so in the 1755, Lagrange informs Euler, Euler that he has a new method to derive his equation. Okay? And uh, then uh, in the year after, Euler lectures on the new method of uh, Lagrange in Berlin, but he did not publish the paper. That uh, actually was published in 1766 in uh, uh, St. Petersburg. Now I will come back about that because this has, uh, uh, has been uh, 
I would say, uh, something that historians have discussed quite a lot, where the, uh, uh, I mean, say, well, I will come back later about that. So, and from 55 to 62, there is a quite a long correspondence between uh, Lagrange and Euler. And I would like to stress two points of this discussion. So Lagrange discussed uh, uh, the, the, the topic with the Euler, and both they, they, they have problems, they had uh, remarks, they improve uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the method, and uh, uh, he insists a lot on uh, the, the, the relevance of the delta calculus for the minimum action principle and uh, how important was minimum the least action principle for physics. He insists uh, more or less in every letter that the least action principle is the basis for the physics. Okay? On the other side, Euler, he all the time praise the delta calculus, but he avoids completely the least action principle. Lagrange asks, he wants to put, publish a book, a treatise on calculus of variation, and uh, by the way, La Euler called the delta calculus of Lagrange calculus of variations. He wants to write a book, the treatise on uh, delta calculus and the least action principle is basic for all physics and uh, ask even if he can publish that book in Berlin and uh, uh, Euler says avoids any answer, any comment on that. The only comment uh, he, he, he wrote was that Maupertuis will, will according when he was li alive or later on was there, or would have uh, been very happy about your application of least action principle. That was the maximum Euler uh, state. Well, in 62, Lagrange gives up his idea of a treatise and published in the second volume of the Miscellanea uh, Tauri Tauriensis papers, which are two, a sort of two summaries, more than papers. One is a said, you know, well, uh, an essay on a new method for determining maximum and minima uh, of integrals, and a, a second paper was application for the methods uh, of the previous method to the solution of different problems in mechanics, in dynamics. Okay? That was the, the result of uh, uh, all this correspondence, which lasted for quite some years. It was interrupted by the, the war and so on. But uh, And then later on in 64, he published the research sur la liberation de la lune. Okay. And uh, in 88, he published the Mechanique Analytique. Now, the mechanical analytic, in fact, was more or less ready at that time. And he worked on the mechanical analytic in uh, Berlin, and uh, he published just uh, essentially the year, or year later, when he came to, to Paris. Okay, but was already in here. Now, and in 71, and that's uh, 75 years later. Euler published Methodus Nova et Facilis Calculum Variation Tractandi, where he writes down uh, exactly the Euler Lagrange equation, the way we do it. Okay? <coughs> that's what I want to describe now. I guess I, have, I hope to have enough time. So, the delta calculus, what is that? What Lagrange does is introduce a new operator. There was a differential, and it says, well, I introduced another operator. Mm -hmm. That he calls delta, and acts on functions, and not on, uh, in the sense uh, on all points of the functions. 
y, fx, and that's the property that uh, on the independent variable, it vanishes, it vanishes, dx equals zero, the, uh, the, there's something wrong. Yeah, delta x equals zero, it commutes with the ordinary differential and the integral. And otherwise, it operates exactly as the ordinary differential. And one might think, and it thinks of the, the operator as the operator variation of a function, which is something that has remained, actually, among physicists. They think of the variation of function not as mathematicians, but in that way. I have a function, I vary the function. And you ask, what does it mean? You yeah, vary the function. Okay? Nowadays, they do that way, and it did that way, uh, Euler must have a sense. Okay? <coughs> so, if zeta is the integral, the variation of zeta is n dy, delta y, p delta p, and it's n delta y, p plus p, delta dy, divided by dx. Simply, according to the rules, you operate. And then the variation of the integral, because of the, the delta commutes with the, the, the integral, is the delta zeta, and it's n dy dx, delta y dx, plus the integral of p delta dy. And now it changes, it commutes delta d becomes d delta. Okay, over there. And then it integrates by parts. Now just uh, uh, taking into account that the dot boundary points are not varying, so the variation is zero. It concludes that the variation of z is the integral of n dx minus dp times delta y. <coughs> now, that's for any variation. If the curve is a minimum for the integral, the variation of the integral has to be zero. If there is a minimum, the variation is zero. Okay? So, n dx minus dp equals zero, which means n minus dp over dx equals zero. That was Euler equation. Okay, that's the deriv derivation of uh, Lagrange. Uh, well, now we come uh, first, uh, I should say, well, now first uh, let me tell about minimum action principle. Now, uh, the, the, uh, the action principle uh, for Lagrange, that's for, for Maupertuis, was that the integral of the velocity times ds has to be minimum. Okay, for, let, me, let, let us think of a single body moving, okay, but the same is for a system of particles, doesn't change anything. And that's one of the points of Lagrange that he used for systems, while Euler used always for one particle. Okay, so the According to Lagrange, the variation of the integral of u ds has to be zero for a physical system in equilibrium. That is uh, taking the variation u delta ds plus delta u ds. ds is the element of the line on which the, 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 the body is moving. Uh, this has to be zero. Okay? This is the star equation. Now, as uh, had already done Euler in his appendix, in his second, in his second appendix, uh, he joined that maximum, that minimum least action principle, with the conservation of energy of the forza viva. Okay, so that means that uh, half of the velocity squared is a constant minus the action on the body of the external action. P dp, q dq, where p q is the distance from the point. Okay? 
And now he computes u delta u. u delta u is just a variation of this, and uh, you can see it's just that. I mean, you operate like a normal differential, you just write delta instead of d. Okay? And then if you put together conservation plus this computation, you end up with uh, u delta ds minus p delta p t delta p minus q delta t delta q, that's zero. At this point, Lagrange uses ordinary Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z, ds is the square root of uh, it's a standard, u squared is x, square, x prime squared plus y prime squared plus xi, z prime squared, and he computes uh, u delta ds. Okay? He, he computes, I mean, it's just a differentiation, nothing else. I mean, it's a little bit complicated and long, but he computes that, okay? And then writing dp, p was the distance in terms of uh, Cartesian coordinates, and uh, simplifying the notation in this way, he concludes that the derivative of u, the derivative of u dx over ds, that's plus p dt, that's zero. And the same for the other coordinates. And now you replace u by the square root of x prime square plus y square. It simplifies with the ds, that is the square root, and you end up with x double dot plus p equals zero, y double dot plus omega equals zero, z double z dot z plus c equals zero, which is nothing else than a, a Newton equation, at least what uh, we think Newton wrote, or we, we say that Newton wrote, okay? And that's the way Lagrange wrote the equation, and it's more interesting in the equation. He said, in terms of the position vector, it's the sum of m, the second derivative of the ve position vector, times delta r, the distance, equal the sum of the exterior force that now need not to be uh, conservative, might be also non conservative, times the r. Now the delta, you see, there is a, there was a minimum problem, but now it's disappeared here. Now the point is, uh, you write this equation, and you can write this equation only if you have a delta, an operator delta. So the operator delta has become the way of formulating the physical principle. Okay. Now, uh, that was the situation when uh, Lagrange wrote the, third, the two papers in the second volume of uh, the, the, the Michelin. Yeah? And remember, Newton, uh, uh, Euler never was uh, wanted to discuss this action principle. Okay. And Lagrange wanted to find, fi found all physics on list action principle, and they never agreed. Now, what you hear is uh, several positions. I mean, there are discussion why that was the behavior. Now, uh, there are many reasons that people discuss. One is that, uh, well, people usually stress on Euler the fact that it was very uh, very, let's see, how one should say, very um, fair with Lagrange. He had uh, reworked Lagrange's paper, Lagrange's idea, but he never published before, and he told Lagrange he would never publish. Okay? So there is a huge literature starting from, uh, what was his name? Okay, well. Just immediately, the one who talked to Lagrange wrote immediately after. Presser. Presser. No? Presser. 
Well, I, I don't remember. Uh, it doesn't come to my mind. The just praising. What is your question? Who was uh, who wrote about Lagrange immediately after he died? He he he, he wrote a long paper, a long paper on uh, Elogio for the Academy. The Lambre. The Lambre says, well, uh, Euler was like that, and then everybody says Euler was. Uh, on the other hand, he was not so fair with the least action principle. He didn't didn't want to help Lagrange in publishing the treatise. He didn't want to have anything to to do with the list action principle. So there are people who complain about that. Okay. Now I would say I guess it's always very difficult to discuss this kind of questions of problems for history because one could also say that Euler just came out from a very uh, big fight with uh, with uh, uh, D'Alembert on the conservation uh, uh, law on the on the um, sorry on the divergence equal zero on the the conservation of matter. Okay, did he exactly the same uh, in the sense that when Alembert published the, the paper, one presented the paper for the competition in Berlin. After one year, Lagre Euler lectured on the same subject, never mentioning Lagrange, and then only two or three years later, he stated, but well, but, but what's clear that that was uh, what Lagrange, uh, D'Alembert had done, but he had never quoted D'Alembert. Okay? So probably after that experience, he didn't want to, to do the same with Lagrange. Okay? On the other hand, uh, People from uh, mostly from the Italian side, they say that uh, Euler was uh, unfair with uh, uh, Lagrange because uh, he, he was very upset that a young person wanted to talk of the least action principle uh, that had already a long history, and Euler were, had been in really very much involved on that. Maybe he was fed up. Uh, not only that, not only that, I think. Oh, yeah, no, no. So much. Uh, that might be one reason, but there is, I think, uh, if one uh, gave up uh, the psychology, the, the sociology, the, the, the all that, there is a more substantial reason, I think. And is that uh, uh, Euler didn't believe anymore that the least action principle was the basis for physics. In the mechanics already he had already he had planned it stated a program, a research program, stating explicitly that the basic principle for physics is what now we call Newton equation, at that time was the ordinary uh, equation for mechanics. I mean, because it was thought that that was just the equation, Galilei equation, infinitesimal version of Galilei equation. Anyhow, Newton equation is the basis for mechanics and not the minimum principle. On the other hand, Lagrange was already on the way of giving up, he himself, of giving up the idea that the least action principle was the basis of physics. I mean, in uh, 59, he entered in contact with D'Alembert, and uh, already in the paper of his students, with the complicated names, you okay, appears a sort of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, of enthusiasm for uh, D'Alembert, okay, and then he met D'Alembert in Paris, and he's already on the way of thinking that D'Alembert principle is the real uh, basis for physics. So both of them, they are already agreeing that least action principle is not really what 
uh, is fundamental for, for, for mechanics. Okay? Well, this equation is exactly the, the D'Alembert principle, or if you like, is uh, the virtual work or virtual velocity principle. And that was the basis. What Lagrange took as basis for uh, me mechanics. Okay? This. And this appears clearly in the paper uh, on the uh, liberation of, uh, of uh, the, 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 the moon. Okay? Okay. If one wants to be more precise, is the principle virtual work, work velocity plus D'Alembert principle. But I don't want to enter the field, of, as I did not enter the field of least action principle, which, uh, just to, to remind you, goes back to, the, to Maupertuis and involves a lot of people. Leibniz, Koenig, uh, uh, Friedrich II, um, Voltaire, and so on. It's a long story. Okay, now this principle, this equation here, implies least, the least action principle, in fact. And, but uh, implies something more. And is that, uh, and that's uh, uh, very interesting, I think, I guess, uh, it's the way Lagrange comes to the Euler-Lagrange equation in general, okay? He starts with, I mean, if you read u square, u is the velocity. The velocity does not depend on the coordinates, it's the velocity, okay? Now you write the velocity in certain coordinates. And uh, Lagrange, like very much the generalized coordinates that would uh, uh, allow him to, to get rid of constraints. Okay? So he writes the velocity, actually the, 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 the modulus of the velocity, one half u squared, as a function of generalized coordinates, q and q prime. Okay? Then uh, he can take variations and compute what is uh, 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 u delta u, is that quantity here. Then we integrate, integrates by parts and gets this equation that this difference is equal delta f this derivative of f with respect to q prime delta q minus this integral. Again, it's just a computation assuming that the one half u squared is f, is a function of q and q prime. This here yields immediately the second derivative of the position vector times delta r, r is, the inter is equal to the derivative with respect to time of df to, with respect to q prime minus df dq delta q. Okay. Then he proves, nowadays we would say covariance of that quantity, covariance of uh, Euler operator, Euler Lagrange operator, saying that if you take uh, different coordinates, okay, and you compute the same thing, you get the same equation. So that's the equation for the mechanics. That's the conclusion at which uh, Lagrange comes in the, in the paper, which is a completely different way that it's usually presented. It's not that you minimize the, 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 the energy, the, the potentially the cinetic energy, okay? So the delta cal calculus and the calculus of variations is, I guess I have still five minutes, right? Okay. Uh, comes in that way as a result of the delta calculus. Okay? Now the point is that uh, you see the, 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 there is another point which is delicate, though it's not completely trivial, about uh, the, the least action principle. And is uh, the following. I mean, you see, 
start, for instance, from uh, uh, <coughs> Newton equation the conser for conservative forces. Okay, then uh, one can introduce the energy, which is one half uh, with the plus u, one half v velocity squared plus u, and then uh, uh, the, the least action principle can be stated also in that way, that the integral from t1 to t2 m v squared dt minimum has to be minimum for all motion with the same energy, prescribed energy is zero, because the energy is conserved. Yeah? The point is that this formulation does not work. It's just inconsistent. One cannot fix time, the starting and final <coughs> time and the energy. Okay? Now there is a way, and that's uh, the way that Jacobi found for separating the physics from the geometry, okay? But I, I don't want to enter that. And there is another way of doing that, and is to introduce the Lagrangian function. Instead of taking the energy, which was uh, the, the cinetic energy plus the potential energy, we take the cinetic energy minus the potential energy. Okay, then uh, if one easily computes that two times the cinetic energy is Lagrangian plus energy, which is constant, so minimizing with fixed the interval of times L is the same that minimizing T. And then you get the Lagrangian and a minimizer of the Lagrangian as the actual motion. That's the way usually is presented, but that's not the way of Lagrange. Okay, fine. <coughs> now, 72 minutes, and that's are enough, and I could have included everything in this, I could have done everything in these two minutes, actually the f entire proof of Euler-Lagrange equation, except that already that story m shows clearly that the point was not the equation and the way the equation was uh, derived. Of course, it's the equation and the way it was proved. But because there were hundreds uh, of other reasons, okay? if we, we want to stay with the Euler-Lagrange equation, then it's very, very simple. That's the integral, okay? Then uh, what is, if u is a minimizer, f u is less than f v for any v with the same extremal points, okay? Take any function phi with a zero value at the boundary values, <coughs> points, then uh, the real value at fun value at function phi t equal integral of fx u plus t phi, u prime plus t phi prime, okay? That should be zero, should be have a minimum at t equal zero. But as we know, if a function is a real function has a minimum at the point, its derivative is zero. Then you compute the derivative, which is a kind of triviality, okay? You integrate by parts, and you get the Euler-Lagrange equation. That was exactly uh, the, the paper. I mean, what you find in the paper of Euler 75 years after Johann Bernoulli. And the main contribution is the variation is u plus t phi, or if you like, is a function of uh, uh, t and x, that at t equals zero is u, and then it's smooth. And at the first order, every such a family of function of variation would write as u plus t phi. T phi. Okay, that's all, and I thank you very much. For <laughs> Thank you, Professor Giaquinta, for your uh, exposition. Uh, very interesting on uh, Lagrange, Euler, and uh, after Lagrange. <laughs>
Just I'm curious about the last uh, transparent. Last. Yes, yeah, this one. one. Uh, the, the letter of Lagrange to Euler uh, when he was 18 years old was about exactly this deduction with the same method and so on. So why? why do Not exactly. Uh, because he used the variation, but he doesn't write explicitly what is the variation. What that's very integration by part and so on. Of course, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's the same as uh, Euler. Yeah. I mean, all is based on in one integration by parts, on taking variation and taking an integration by parts. But the way it's done is different in Euler, in Lagrange, and in Euler again. And the reason was that they were looking at uh, some sort of different questions. So then, uh, you uh, once, you know, once you know uh, the result, so once you know that the variation is exactly u, well, u plus t phi, all it's trivial. And My you can read again uh, on the, back in the history, the same argument. My question is maybe what's the step you give credit to Euler? I mean, if you compare the letter of Lagrange, which was before. Uh, I mean, Euler was 1744, was 10 years before Lagrange. And he had proved, had derived Lagrange equation. Uh, my question is bef uh, be between this letter of Lagrange and the uh, other last paper of Euler. Yeah. What's what's uh, the progress? I mean, what's uh, none? None. Okay. From no, so from so our so point so of view, none. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I mean, uh, it's what has happened that it's a lot. You see, from us is uh, this derivation from Lagrange was the calculus, which would lead to the physics and to the mechanics, because. Uh, then uh, the, the same equation is on the basis of the entire mechanics. You see? And uh, if you think of uh, this variation of, I mean, the, the variation we work with in mechanics, that would not be of much help. It's much more convenient to use Lagrange operator. Maybe uh, I. I can maybe give an opinion about uh, your question why Euler didn't uh, argue about uh, least action principle. There is something uh, for, uh, clear for everybody at that time is uh, that uh, there are forces that, that are from a potential and other which are not from a potential. And uh, I mean, uh, if you look at Newton equations and uh, D'Alembert principle, then it works even for forces which are not uh, from right. potential. Right. So it's more general. This right. is what one part, one point. Right. And second point is uh, the idea of force de derived from potential is not s easy at all uh, at that time, at the time of uh, when, uh, uh, right. especially if you have several particles. No, I don't understand the point. Uh, so. Um, if uh, maybe Euler preferred uh, Newton equations, it's maybe, maybe for two reasons. One is uh, that it is more general, and the second one is it, it is not clear what is exact hypothesis for a potential. No, no absolutely not. I mean, the discussion about uh, potential and non-potential, I mean, uh, conservative and non-conservative, that's much later started. Yes, uh, yes, yes. yes. This okay. is what, uh, what I say. The yes. program, Euler program, is from 1736, from the first volume of mechanics. In the introduction, he states the general program that the equation, Newton equation should be the basis for all kinds of, of the mechanics of points, of bodies, and of fluids. So 
could not be that the reason, because it was not, was not aware of that. And uh, the, first, uh, the first time when uh, uh, occurred a real distinction between conservative and non-conservative forces, that's this with D'Alembert. So you, you see, I would say, as I told you from the beginning, actually, if we think of Euler-Lagrange equation, I could say that's Euler equation, like I could have said, that's the Euler-Lagrange equation is derived in these five lines. That's all. But you see, if you do that, uh, you miss 70 years of history of interesting facts which are not any more interesting for us because that's the way we do Lagrange, Euler-Lagrange Euler equation, of course. There is another way of doing mechanics. We can do it many different ways. We can use Lagrangian approach, we can use Hamiltonian approach, and so on. From nowadays' point of view, we can just forget all and say we have understood things and we do it in a different way. Of course. But assuming that the, the force are derived from a potential, if you, if, you are, if you don't, then no Lagrangian, no Hamiltonian, and then you have to, to go back to Newton. And I just showed that you need not. You can do with the uh, least action principle. What is this equivalent? What do you mean uh, you have to do to go back to Newton? You the want to action principle, you, you need the energy, you, as you said several times. And if you, it's not from a potential, no energy, so you cannot do anything. I don't, yeah. I don't understand you. what you, you, you mean. Sorry. Other questions? Other questions on this subject? So you you showed wonderfully that uh, even for analysis it was very very long a long time very difficult to understand, but for algebra it was even more even till now <laughs> this formalism was very mysterious, and I'm thinking about a, a quite a provocative chapter in, in Saunders MacLean book, uh, forms and uh, numbers I think, uh, where it's wide to give a perfectly functorial and category theoretic foundation to this formalism. So it looks completely crazy. So you get uh, exactly this formalism, this equation. Which one? Which formalism? The, um, the delta calculus. Yeah. So you know exactly, uh, in, th in that book he explained exactly when this is a tangent space, where this is a cotangent space, everything. So everything is perfectly clear for category th uh, theorists. But then there is no mechanics, no, no everything else is lost. <laughs> so wh what do you think about this kind? Of, uh, it's a different way of understanding. For uh, pure algebra, it becomes quite clear, but you lose almost everything. So, <laughs> so it's. Uh, what do you think of this uh, different way of understanding, understanding uh, calculus, abstract calculus? I'm more. I'm more interested in understanding what was going on <laughs> and why it was going on in a certain way or another way. But, uh, I mean, everybody can uh, state and restate things as he likes. I mean, whereas uh, uh, I'm very tolerant in any <laughs> respect. <laughs> I have no opinion. I don't think it's particularly interesting, but uh, that's my opinion, and uh, I mean, it's the opinion of uh, everybody else, I mean, of any person you meet from the, on the street. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> Other question, also in French, if uh, you want. Moi, je préfère parler français. Ah, et, bon, et, 
Et oui, je suis assez d'accord sur l'histoire que vous nous avez donnée de, 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 du calcul des variations et des de contributions de Lagrange et Euler. Et, mais et, il, faut, il faut avouer que Euler, pour, pour trouver ces équations, a employé des presque une centaine de pages, non pour, pour arriver. Non. Non, oui, non. et pour, faire, pour développer les questions. Non, non, non. <laughs> so the, the computation I have uh, brought to you come directly from the work of the people, and not simplification. I mean, the simplification consists on the fact that uh, Euler, he, as well as Lagrange, they never consider essentially functions of its x, y, p. They consider a function depending on all derivatives, so all jets. So here you would have yes. comma and then dots. Oui, mais, mais so a few more letters, mm. P, Q, R, that's all because after R was complicated, T was already used for time. So there was a comma, dot, and then all formula, the formulas were all uh, um, repeated. Yes, yes, so but despite the fact that they were the same formula, they would repeat all formulas for every variable. Yes, but, uh, but, but it was not an oui, but the method of uh, Euler ne peut pas se, uh, se prolonger à aux fonctions de plusieurs variables. C'est ça. C'est une autre question. Euh, oui, c'est ça. C'est assez difficile uh, de prolonger uh, la méthode de Euler pour so des fonctions de plusieurs variables. That's true. Mm. That's true. Mm -hmm. voilà. So I think you can, if you stay with the same idea of the uh, Euler, that dx dy would be just the element, mm. and that so it would be a sort of uh, again finite elements, but yes. you can do the same in terms of finite, uh, instead of finite elements with all that. Yes. But he did not do any, he did not work on function on uh, integrals in several variables, that was Lagrange who did it yes. for the minimal uh, surface uh, 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 equation. Uh, uh, oui, il a étudié pour, pour le premier l'équation de surface minimale. Yeah. Oui. Oui. Et that was Lagrange. Oui, oui, oui. Euler, 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 oui. He has yeah. all kind of adjective for Lagrange. Bien sûr. Et Just to say why he didn't think it was the same thing. He didn't think it was the same. So is the same. It's the same if you know the end of the story. As always, if you know the end of the story, everything is the same. Mm. Oui, et, oui, pour, pour les fondements de la mécanique, vous avez raison. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle Trousdell n'aimait pas Lagrange. <laughs> Parce qu'il a été convaincu que les fondements de la, de la mécanique sont... Truth, oui, les, mécanique, les fondements de la mécanique doivent être plausés, comme on faisait Euler sur les, sur les principes de Newton. Malheureusement, on a des problèmes qui ne sont pas libres. Et ben alors, les équations de Newton ne servent pas beaucoup pour les problèmes avec euh, des limitations. Non, c'est une affaire d'introduire des contraintes, des forces, et c'est ça. Et vous le faites. Vous pouvez faire tout. Je veux dire, il y a une idée étrange que faire des mathématiques est comme participer à un Olympique Game. Who is the best? It's not that the point. I mean, yes, people so. contribute in a way or another, and there is no, this is a, the better contribution, this is the worst, this is a, still now, I mean, people who use balance for equation and Lagrangian approach. Yeah, for example, that that both are there. Yeah. I mean, who, which one is the better? Yeah. Now, okay, you can say, we give up everything, it's, Hamiltonian way. Oui. 
I mean, or is what? Symplectic geometry. Why not? Includes everything. We can include everything in all and that's, uh, you end up with, uh, okay, there is a theory which includes everything. Maybe we don't understand very much what is going on, but it includes everything. <laughs> yes, you don't. We say. La mécanique maintenant peut commencer avec euh, comme Landau avec la Lagrangienne ou yeah. <laughs> right. avec les équations de Newton. Mm. Merci beaucoup.